international guest at Dr. Sabrina Pistolic. Um, she's a theoretical physicist and an advocate for women in STEM. She's been fascinated by aerospace engineering and even built an aircraft when she was a teenager. She attended MIT and Harvard and has contributed massively to the physics field, including the discovery of the spin memory effect. I think it's safe to say she's a genius. I like to welcome meet you and speak to you and for you to be here and I hope you've had a lovely time in Cambridge. Um, I was just wondering if you could start off by asking, like just tell us about yourself and your work. Um, just whatever. Sure, yeah. so I'm a high energy uh, theoretical physicist, which I, high energy refers to the fact that we study physics at very short distance scales. Um, and so the program of research that I'm working on is basically trying to apply kind of what we've distilled from what we think the very short distance description is, just string theory, to something more practical and understand how to encode like scattering as we see it either at CERN or gravitational waves coming into like LIGO uh, in a consistent framework that actually has this holographic principle. So I can go into more details <laughs> of that, but at some point probably just would get like too abstract. And we can also <laughs> like, appreciate a little bit how fun it is to really think about uh, the layers of abstraction uh, in the ideas that we, we study. So. That's incredible. And obviously, the most like, educated person I've ever met and spoken to and I've had it. Um, and you've achieved a lot, I think it's safe to say, um, in your whole career. Like, you've made onto the, like, the Forbes 30 and the 30 list, um, various awards, various honours. Um, but what to you has been your proudest achievement to date? I mean, I think the fact that like, there's a disconnect between the way that um, maybe the public sees science or people in science and kind of the hype that you can get because of a good story with like the aerospace engineering background and then actually like getting a faculty job. So I was just very happy that I didn't ruin things before and that I'm actually faculty. Yeah. Um, and just on, you just mentioned like aerospace yeah. engineering and like your experiences like building aircraft. How yeah. was that as a teenager to just build your own aircraft and then everything and that's like followed along from that? So I think it's a funny story. Basically, when I was little, I at some point was interested in like, aerospace engineering and more like the role models were like, I guess at the time it was Richard Branson, Elon Musk, and Jeff Bezos had these private aerospace companies. Um, and so it was like a combination of being inspired by those people and then like a really uh, kind of out there attempt by my family and myself to like try to get into MIT for undergrad and you have these like hyper competitive uh, undergraduate admission. <laughs> so it's like, well, what can you do to really stand out? And one thing you can do is I guess you can start taking flying lessons at, at like any age. So I was nine at the time. Um, but then at some point you're just learning how to fly and it's whatever. Uh, we'd go to these uh, air shows uh, like Oshkosh Air Venture and you'd meet people who were putting together kit planes. And so one high school teacher was saying, well, this won't help you get into high school because at some point the only thing that you've done is something that everybody else could do but younger. Um, and so he kind of challenged me and we decided like to, to start building this kit plane. So there's that. And then at some point though, um, you kind of like, like I was, I was sending these like these video clips of me putting together this uh, aircraft kit to like people at the origin or whatnot to try to get their attention. And, and it works because you're young, you're doing something that's kind of weird. But at some level, like you're really trying to just build the story. And at some point, you've built this long story arc. And the question is, what are you going to do with it? Um, and so for a while, I didn't know what I would do with it. And I kind of switched over to physics at some point and was uh, surprised, I guess, that like right as I was entering graduate school, the story kind of popped up again, and that's how I got this hype in physics somehow. And so it was interesting just how the story that I intentionally had tried to build to get into undergrad, it didn't even work because I got like waitlisted and then I had to really <laughs> push to get, to get into this undergrad, comes back and either bites you or helps you depending on how you view it. Um, and so the fun thing now is to try to see like what can I use from that um, for things that I care about now within my field. Amazing. Yeah. I feel like there's certainly a way to get someone's attention is to build a plane and like, fly it as well, especially at such a young age. Um, always that's quite a scary thing, and I've watched a few of your interviews, I've watched um, as it was happening, um, 
and your mum said that she was quite worried. Yeah. Do you feel like having that support of background from your family, like with them taking you to air shows, has been like yeah. fundamental in? I mean, it was fundamental to that that narrative. Um, but to whatever extent, it was interesting. Like as an adult, I think that I am more surprised at the things that I did as far as like not being scared. Like there's a level of trust. It's like if when you're putting something together and then your dad is overseeing like over your shoulder looking at what you're doing and it's fine. You're like, oh, this is great. And then at some point, you're an adult and you realize the limitations to your parents' like, expertise. And you're like, oh my god, <laughs> what did I get? <laughs> And so it's, it's definitely eye-opening, um, but also interesting just what you can do when you kind of uh, put your mind to it and you don't see, I guess, um, like, it's a straightforward thing, and, and so it's something straightforward that you can do, you can just run and finish that thing. And research is very different from that, and so it's interesting to kind of always reflect that as soon as you can find a problem that actually is straightforward, you can just run for it and try to bring that back, I think, is something valuable that I, that I appreciate. But. Like incredible, like it's just fascinating to hear just like the educational journey from such a young age, yeah. doing all these innovative things. I think when you started so young mm -hmm. in this like incredible journey, it's only like fair to come on to how that led you to like the physics yeah. and that journey. So how would you say your experience equipped you for like physics? Do you think like it was influential in this decision? So I mean I think that the aerospace engineering side of it had two effects. So one was that I was at the STEM school and the founder of my high school was really interested in like physics first. He was a, uh, he used to be a director of Fermilab, so he had this Nobel Prize in physics. Um, and he would have like lunches with the laureates and basically try to encourage people to go into physics. And so I think having that mentor made that more of a possibility or like that an idea. Um, also, most of the students at my school wanted a PhD. So it's a different like background where suddenly like academia has some value. And then um, besides that, like the people that I really admired who were running these aerospace companies, they were doing this as like their like side like project now that they had like wealth from other ventures, and yet they somehow admired physics, and I didn't understand why they did. Like you could see this like Milner Prize, like these break, uh, breakthrough prizes are funded by these people who have other wealth that they want to like make. Why do they care about making science famous or what? I don't know their motivation, but like, a lot of those first breakthrough prizes went to people in like string theory. So I think part of like the fact that the people that I admired admired these like theoretical physicists pushed me in a direction of a field where I didn't really understand what I was getting into. So it's really funny. It's like definitely aerospace engineering led me into physics, but like unclear like that that was a good thing yeah. or why like that, that actually made sense. And so it's super funny because like sometimes in physics you run into like, well, what, what have you done lately as far as um, these like fields can become a little bit relatively stagnant as far as like when are breakthroughs happening? Um, like the last like a computation or result that like led to a Nobel Prize would be like a result from 50 years ago and 25 years ago for these breakthrough prizes, roughly in, in like my niche type field. Um, and so then, you know, like, but compared to say aerospace engineering, I found like most people were doing like building quadcopters, and you'd seen this like rapid like acceleration of progress from like the Wright brothers to then people flying commercially around the world. But now we're scared to go to the moon with people or whatnot. <laughs> and so it's kind of funny how it's like I felt aerospace engineering was at the level now where it's just like, don't mess things up, keep going. And um, so for me, physics was a much like more recent instead of new revolutions in some sense, so. No, incredible. And especially with like the theoretical yeah. physics. So you joined the, the Parameter Institute when you were 27? Mm -hmm. I probably got the job offer around then, but I mean, I, I, I've since then a couple of years in fast, so I'm, I'm uh, 30 now. Um, but I'm, it's super nice to be able to have like an academic job. It's like it's it's funny how different it changes when you um, you have like your whole life in front of you, or at least or until ten year track clock. Maybe you have to be worried um, to do research versus when it's like three years or however long your PhD is to really make it or break it and make an impact. Um, and so also like the resources available to you become very like different. Suddenly it's more also about the team that you're building instead of just your individual work product. And so um, yeah, I've been, I'm lucky that I've had a faculty job for enough time that I can really uh, appreciate the difference. Yeah. So obviously with the Parameter Institute, yeah. it has like theoretical physics yeah. at its core. Right? It is just that. Yeah. And that's really cool, right? <laughs> so the fun thing about um, when you're doing something that is very abstract, oftentimes even like the engineering friends, when I, they were saying that I wanted, like I was saying I wanted to go into theoretical physics, they're like, why would you do that? Like it's not practical. And so like their value like metric is coming from like how practical something is. Um, and I can get to later why I still think there are practical things that can come out of the work. Like I mean, that's going to be a, 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 like a deflection. Um, but theoretical physics being like the front and center, the only purpose of a research institute, not only like is great that they have jobs then for theoretical physics, but also creates an environment where like the whole AV team, all of everything that's set up to um, do your work better is now a priority. So like at Harvard, I, my advisor can be this like really say, famous theoretical physicist, but he's not top dog at the university. 
his part of the department isn't even the top like focus of that department. And so it's weird how suddenly like the resources that are much greater at say Harvard are not really like for just your, your work. And so it's super cool and there's different questions you can try to answer when you're at a place that is just for your field, especially when it's so niche. <laughs> yeah. So do you see that theoretical physics will become the future of physics? I, so I think that there's a thread of that theoretical physics is that gives it this longevity and that's what I liked about like really formal theory as compared to other branches of physics that naturally should either become their own fields or merge into other engineering disciplines. Um, and so to me, like part of the value of, of that institute is like it's one of the few places that really is supporting something that I think has a very long legacy and that somehow what people conflate with when they say that they study physics. It's like the kind of like the why are we here type questions in a more like a quantitative way. Um, and so I think there's a staying power to that brand that uh, is really cool and really something to, to like to try to support. Um, but I'm not saying the future after that there will be other future. Like there's already like quantum engineering departments that are like whole new departments <laughs> just for part of it. It's like no, keep keep some of the value there in your physics department so you have funding. But yeah. So you were saying just like, briefly before about yeah. how we found that people attach value to practicality. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that's a fair judgment to make on something's value by I'm, how practical it can be? So I think that there's. Any judgment can be fair for like the reasons that they're starting from. But I think that one thing that people don't keep in mind is like somehow like so one thing when you're when in a field where suddenly everybody's asking you like what's the value of this, what's the value of this, you can either become like like delusional or jaded. <laughs> right? So what actually would be like if, I, if what I'm doing is valuable, then I can find a reason why everything else that you're doing is valuable. Right? And so it's very easy to try to see like well in, under what conditions would you say this is value? It's like what time scales do you value things? So I could say like this legacy that we're part of is, is super long and that that staying part of being able to add to that has a lot of immense value. But I think even for the practical level, there's a question of like, how would an experimentalist motivate their um, experiment to be funded? And there's two things. One thing could be, we're really gonna measure this thing and we're gonna change our understanding of the, the universe. And I'd say that that value is still there in the formal pure theory part. But then there's another way that it's often like pitched, which is that the technology you'd need to make this experiment work is going to have other more practical applications. And I think that's also something that theoretical physics has that we don't really ever think about. And this is also something that you would never think about when you're at a department at a larger university, because sometimes those tools are not from your own field. So the aerospace engineering example, maybe it's going to be better power plants or like different like, like related um, components that are gonna have improvements that are gonna then revolutionize your field. And as Boeing, you would care about that. But as the course 16 person, you might not. So in our field, whether it's like better semantic search is going to come out of like uh, progress in AI, that's something that a theoretical physics institute can care about and be a part of trying to make sure that research is done better and like how would we make it more effective. Um, but maybe a department in a university would just say, let the ML people do that. <laughs> right. So I feel like a few of us in the room might not be scientists, yeah. um, including myself. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering if you could explain to us more like theoretical physical concepts, sure. such as like um, celestial holography. Like, yeah. what does that mean for us? Because I know that's quite a, like a big thing. Okay. In the world. So, what I the the Simon's collaboration that we're working on is, is titled celestial holography, and I try to give two versions of the definition. So, the 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 definition that I use in like the introductions or abstracts for like a paper would be that we're positing that quantum gravity in in four dimensional asymptotically fast space times is encoded in this two dimensional celestial sphere. And we're trying to build up the like symmetries of that hologram and consistent boundary description of our theory. But the, the practical thing is basically that we want to have a consistent framework that describes very low energy physics, so large distance scales, very short distance physics. We know at short distances there's quantum mechanics, long distances there's um, gravity, but it's not Newtonian, but like general relativity. And you want one framework that can capture both. And so in studying quantum gravity, people have found um, that whether you're thinking at like abstract like thought experiments about what's happening near a black hole and its evaporation, or um, going all the way to like finding a consistent theory that doesn't have certain um, like short distance problems and saying there's a string theory, uh, both of those guys tell you that quantum gravity should be holographic. And so we're using this, like the abstract thing is that we want to have a framework that's simpler, that describes different limits of things that we've probed, and that also imports into it knowledge that we've distilled from other like things that we've built up. And so for me, part of the value of celestial holography isn't so much that, okay, it's trying to be more realistic, our space times don't have like this negative cosmological constant, like these ADS-CFT examples, but it's also the fact that we're connecting different disciplines. So at a very short scale, 
Um, part of the reason why we had this collaboration is because we have people who are doing like twisted holography and twisters and um, like soft limits of amplitudes coming together to solve the same problem. And so that interdisciplinarity is neat because it's like it's the same problem solved by different things and it actually is very natural in this context because we're, we're coming across the same symmetry groups. Um, but I think if you scale that back and you say, okay, so what's the value of really being able to, to bridge together different things? At a very large scale, that's like basically the problem that we run into in fundamental physics. If you're not building a, a hypothesis that you're going to test with some experiment, you can't kill that idea. <laughs> so the only way that you can kill ideas is basically, can you say whether or not they're self-consistent with each other? And you can build a bunch of self-consistent frameworks. And so by basically being able to appreciate that there is kind of a language problem in various like, specific disciplines, and celestial holography is trying to solve a little bit of that um, at a very short time scale of people, what they, people have been doing in the last like, couple uh, decades. Um, you can scale that up to being like, can we have um, a better organization of this knowledge canon that we're building up on because we're going to have that problem um, more and more when we start adding <laughs> new statements to our theories, right? I have like the scientific approach itself yeah. as you test it to make sure it works. And that's why like, they're partly called theories because you can't, until new evidence comes along, you, right. you can't prove it that it's a truth. In some sense, yes, but the, the thing is like purely theoretical physics and somehow a little bit more like mathematics. It's like mathematics guided by this intuition in some sense of, um, well, different senses of self-consistency. So I think that you can still add to those theories before you make these experimental predictions and you can also rule out, I guess, different subsets of those theories being self-consistent, um, even without the experimental verification. So you're at that level. Um, and then the question is also experimental verifications are really only of like some aspect of the theory, so it's an effective model for something. And so I think just the there's some value to really appreciating the fact that the uselessness in some sense or that level of abstraction is itself a problem that is the one that we deal with all the time. My mind just keeps getting blown and blown <laughs> by like everything you're saying because it just doesn't occur to me as a historian yeah. that like the, the realm of science. Um, so when I hear you speak about science, I'm just taken aback, and I'm sure there's many of us in the audience who are like, this is incredible stuff. Um, and I know you've heard various like labels such as the new Einstein. How yeah. does that label make you feel? So it was scary to me, because first of all, it's not true, but it's interesting to me how like the, the sense of like, what is the weight of that? Like, I don't understand to what extent like the attention that I used to get was because people being like actually believing it or just thinking it's this is what we say when we want to say somebody's going to be a good theoretical physicist or because it's like why are you saying this I'm going to fight about it and then suddenly there's a tension like whatever the algorithm is, is is promoting it so for me for the longest time I was like how do I use whatever connections that happen to come from these like whatever hype can be a good thing sometimes uh, for good I never thought I would but it's like you can it's hard to turn down certain opportunities and so um, to whatever extent I used to like not, not this stage, but other stages like that. It's like, you know you didn't deserve this stage, but you have it, and will that help you down the line? And I'd have colleagues who would say like, no, it won't. <laughs> because the thing is, it's like physics is done by people, right? And so in some sense, you have a very small set of like maybe 2,000 or so people whose opinions of you really matter. And it's like, you can get all the hype that you want, but unless you can get funding for those 2,000 people, like it's, it's like counterproductive, right? Because suddenly you have a reputation you haven't lived up to or whatnot. So I never, I always thought that one day, hopefully it just like fades out, I think like um, pandemic and everybody going inside. I mean, these things are very short lived little like social media things. So it was gone, which is good. Um, but I think that hopefully there's a way to try to use that to some extent. So it's like, I think the thing that I've appreciated after getting a faculty job, and especially because suddenly you're not competing, it's not a zero sum game for those jobs, is that there's a small community of people who we really work for. Like I, I work for the Perimeter Institute, but I also work for like high energy theory or like string theory as a community. And in some sense, we collectively are that Einstein. Like, and I totally believe that. Like, it, like our research is what, when you think of Einstein, you should think of like fundamental string theory, like, and, like an adjacent, like very pure theoretical research. Um, and so, to what extent that brand isn't something that we control, but ran, like randomly somebody who will say like, let's promote women in science. Let's pick this girl. She has this aerospace engineering background. That's really cool. So she must be good when she goes to physics, right? As as that example, um, it's like first of all, we obviously can't control that brand, but we also can't capitalize it in a way where it turns into like people who maybe don't want to go the fully formal theory route. Well, then like you get into these like wars on either YouTube or via like popular science books about. Um, what the right theory is, but the whole thing is like, it's not necessarily a zero-sum game. It's like we all, like, if there is a problem with the fact that it's getting too abstract, then that, can you see that as a good thing? Can you see that as like, this is the problem that we solve and this is why we have value? Because we're solving things, we're trying to understand basically many, many layers of abstraction, and that's a problem that you normally don't run into in your daily life. Um, 
and then also like string theories at some point. <laughs> so, so just yeah. touching on your experience, yeah. obviously you're a big advocate for women in STEM. Yeah. How has your personal experience as a woman in such a male-dominated field been? Yeah, so I think the problem is it's a little bit anecdotal. So like I want to be careful not to use my own experience and project it because part of like the biggest problem that I would run into, I would have like the noticeable one was that I got is coming from the way that you get promoted or whatnot. So for example, like I know that if I were just a guy, I would not have had some of the opportunities that I had. I think not a, not in, not in my field. So this is not people in the field, but really the external um, like attention in some sense for like especially that aerospace stuff. So like to whatever extent you put a bound like you put like some sort of prize at like being like this top girl in STEM, you're you're kind of driving like I guess more people into the field, which can be good, but it's not necessarily coming from the change that's happening in the field that makes it a better thing to do. So I used to resent more the fact that, like, just the, the kind of the perception of like being overhyped, and then how that then got translated into like a much more negative thing in my field, um, and the dynamics that that created, rather than something where I felt like many of my colleagues were like actually like biased against me. So I mean, I felt like I, I couldn't decouple the bias that they had because I literally like there was a reason to be like no <laughs> um, from something that was gender specific. But I do think that like the statistics speak for themselves as far as like our field is. I'd say like 10 to 15 percent in like formal theory, and it's like whatever 20 to 25 percent uh, in physics, or like for the undergrad and PhD level. Um, and like that says something, right, about whether or not like conditions are, are such. Um, and the question is that I think that I was raised from a family that was more like if you like lead by example, so try to be good at the job. Um, but that's not clearly like the only solution in some sense. And so. Um, what I like is now being in a position of more power as a faculty member, so you suddenly can care about these things. To what extent by building up more infrastructure around like cross-section academia by discipline, so supporting like high energy theorists everywhere, you can start caring about the pipeline. Um, and so I'm excited for that. But um, just on that, what do you think should be done to rectify that imbalance, the gender imbalance in STEM? Do you think it should be like a top-down approach that like, the government implements, or like a bottom-up approach? I think I'm scared to, I, because the thing is, is that the different approaches are affecting these at different time scales. And so I think what sometimes what happens is when you, like the worst thing is to feel like you got a job that you didn't deserve. And there's a combination of that. So at first I was, I think I was more insulted by before I got the job than after I got the job. I'm like, well, the opportunities that come with it are great. So like before I got the job, it was definitely like, oh my God, like are some of my male colleagues not gonna wanna work with me because if we both write the same paper and then like there's a like slight bias towards like equal people, like the girl gets hired, like they're gonna suddenly see me as competition and not work with me, so it makes it harder to work with people. Now as soon as you have a faculty job, you can hire them, so it's a lot easier to work with. And so then you can kind of see the other argument, which is I have this job now, you have more opportunities, and so you can succeed in a way that, um, like as you get the benefit of the doubt too. It's, it's, it's strange how people will suddenly, like you're more likely to be right, even though like nothing changed before or after that job. Um, so I can see that there's a short-term benefit of it. I think I still wish that like tenure or like like at like the top level of like the assessment of your quality of your work was gender like blind. Um, but I think the thing is is that the the one thing that you should do is just figure out what people do or don't enjoy about their jobs and see if there's something you can change there because you know driving something um, isn't going to be as effective as just making the conditions for it, people to want to be in that job or thrive in that job and then not judging them if it's for different reasons or, or trying to pressure people who would otherwise not because like they want more women in a given field, for example. Yeah. Amazing. Um, if it's okay with you, is yeah. it okay we take some questions from the audience? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, if anyone has any questions? Yeah. So, I have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, the first one that I'm going to get to I'm going to be teaching actual physics at nice. the moment. Awesome. But last year I was doing a master's in theoretical physics. Right. And a couple of times talking to theoretical physics professors, yeah. they told me that something that was hard for them in their field. Yeah. And we're talking about one of string theories and one theoretical cosmology. So yeah. how their work yeah. would probably not have experimental verification yeah. for decades, if not centuries. Yeah. 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 And that was the reason why they suggested to me to think very hard about applying to PhD in physical <laughs> physics. Yeah. Well, on the other hand, astrophysics is more short term. Yeah. So um, I was wondering how you deal with that fact. Yeah. Um, I mean, so I think I deal with it. I mean, so the thing is, you should do whatever you like enough to be focused enough to do that work. And so and whatever motivates you, don't let other people shame you for it or not. So like, I do value practicality. And that's to the detriment of my like, satisfaction with just the research that I do. But I do still see the fact that it's so abstract. Like, basically, the neat thing about formal theory is that, like, the kind of questions like that you're trying to maybe accelerate solving are more on like semantic search rather than just dealing with lots of data. 
And so I think it's fun that then you can appreciate there's this niche that because everybody else in your field really just likes pen and paper, maybe Mathematica. Um, someone who has a little bit more drive to like see if there's something practical can then stand out in a fun way. So it's like, how can I add value to this group of people I now care about because I've whatever drank the Kool-Aid to the extent where I've like <laughs> gone through trying to learn the same knowledge canon. Um, and so I think that it's a valid concern. And if you're going to be motivated by practicality, like by like little experimental verification of your theory, then it's a good advice to, to go into something with more um, data coming in. Yeah. No, but you can do. I mean, I think the thing is, is that there is a level of right or wrong or self consistency that we do deal with. But the problem is somehow it's like it's, it's a bit of a like a data overload as far as like you never really learn like loop quantum gravity and string theory. You, you pick one, and so the question is, do you go on the wrong branch? Yeah. Um, but um, I'm excited more for like like th in the short time. Is there going to be um, rapid progress in? Um, I guess seeing the bigger picture, force of the trees, kind of more of a data science applied to like our literature canon. Um, so I think that there can be some exciting stuff coming now uh, that wouldn't have been possible for like my advisor's generation, and that was, is what makes me excited about my field now. Um, so, yeah. Um, if I may yeah, absolutely. Um, something you touched on multiple yeah. times is the role of maths yes. in the theory, especially for course. Exactly. So that's something I wanted to ask you more about, because something I realized, so my did an in astrophysics, and last year I was doing masters yeah. in theoretical physics, the official school of mathematics. Yeah. And something I realized is how that is not only a tool we use to describe physics, yeah. but also a tool we use to understand physics. Yeah. So I was curious about your, your view on this interplay between maths and physics, and if there is even a, a remote possibility that we are wrong in using maths because that's the same thing. I mean, there's one profound assumption underlying all our work on physics, and that is that maths actually describes our world. Only if you ever thought about that, I'm not so I have thoughts on it. I'm gonna still. I think I'm still gonna be a believer in the maths, but I think it's because again we're building effective frameworks, and so like I think some people might literally like take their like interpretation of quantum mechanics very literally. I think I'm more along the sides of like everything we're studying is probably an effective description. Now I think there's two ways that math comes into this. The one is like what you're seeing when you're like it's, there's a math problem that describes the physics question. Um, but I think that one thing cool about physics is it gives you a purpose for your math. And then also, I'll we'll get back to dualities and interplaying, like where it tells you something about math. Um, and so, like, I think pure mathematics actually is probably like better, like gen the gender bias is slightly like lower, which is great. Um, but also, personally, just maybe as someone who is like interested in physics or coming from that, the thing that I see is like a downside of math is that um, these like fields that are created, you're adding true statements to them, but like they're a little bit disjoint. And so, physics is a fun way of bridging different fields in mathematics. The problem is you don't have that depth or maybe that familiarity that you need to really like come up with like, like I don't know, enough to like be able to prove something <laughs> or be a mathematician. But um, but it's interesting that basically sometimes frameworks in physics, like this ADS-CFT duality, can relate different um, mathematical, like I guess, subfields in some sense. And so there's an intuition that comes from this self-consistent story that I think is beautifully interplays with math. And mathematics is a language, and it's these different mathematical like subjects are different languages in some sense. Um, and physics is itself a language, and I think even you could say like um, like loop quantum gravity or string theory or more fine grain like the bootstrap program um, and uh, the amplitudes program. They have different ideas that they've built up, and some of those ideas like like every time that there is like a breakthrough or whatnot is like sometimes you have a new idea that can explain both, or sometimes you realize that someone else is saying the same thing as you, but you didn't understand that language. Um, and so we have a bit of a translation problem, but the thing about physics is I think we're trying to basically reduce it. Um, and I don't know how much um, like different mathematical disciplines also care about, I guess, like redundancies in that canon. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I had a question here. I just uh, read you uh, your bio. You said that you were doing the statue of polygram. And mm -hmm. uh, also a lot of the gravitational so have you ever come, I have three things I want to ask. Have you ever encountered contact gravity, torsion field, and the zero point energy? Because it's like something like free energy devices or free energy theory that can really revolutionize everything about us from the aerospace engineering or proportion or alternative energy proportion system. 
So, so no for the so like the first one, um, the anti gravity no because it's built into the spin two field the way that we construct it. Um, like there can be like like Casimir energies or whatnot. Like um, like we care more about the Hilbert space having energy bounded from below. Um, but see, that's a funny thing. It's like basically you have these this establishment canon of knowledge that's built up, and then you have uh, alternative theories. And there's really, like, it's not that, like, I want to be able to just say, no, I know you're wrong, because I don't know the best way to explain either, like, or actually understand why an even theory is wrong. But we, you really, um, like, you have disconnected components of the canon in some sense, and you have it. And to me, it's fascinating to just think about that, appreciate that, right? Which is, like, why is it that, like, I can't efficiently, like, tell you, or, or like, vice versa, like, like, how to kill a given um, theory, except for, like, we know that our frameworks preclude it, right? Um, and so I basically would, would try to avoid the question of, like, besides just telling you no, <laughs> um, but turn it into the positive thing is, is like, precisely because there are uh, so many things that even within our own field that we don't know how to say why we don't believe in, like, loop quantum gravity, that that's a possible, like, it's a, it's a thing that's a cool thing that we can try to make better. So, um, so I would say, um, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, on Thursday, one of our emergency debates um, that we're having for the papers, uh, this house will use the Oppenheimer did nothing wrong. Uh -huh. um, so first of all, it'd be great to have your thoughts you know, sort of that way. Yeah. Uh, but also on, sort of from your own personal experience, when you're sort of doing this groundbreaking work, yeah. how much of sort of your, your own moral conclusions um, yeah. come in when you work on these crazy projects? You know, about, I don't know how many work you want to be used in the future or you know, by the company that you're trying to work with. Uh, yeah. Could be fine. So when they say the House disagrees, like so, I've created the format of your debates is like that there actually is a stance that one side is taking, or like, or like or both are equally. Like, yeah. Okay. So okay. proposition will go first, yeah. and then okay. opposition, okay. and then keep going. Fun, fun, fun. Unspoken. Yeah. I mean, I think the funny thing about watching the Oppenheimer movie, I don't know how accurate or like sorry, uh, that that is, was the sense in which it was conveyed in that movie that it was like inevitable that one side would develop something. Um, and so to me, the thing that I dislike from that is to what extent like governments are getting scientists to do things that maybe are wrong you know like and I would say that it is dangerous and that shouldn't like I don't like arms races at all like I think to me that's the scariest thing like because like the motivation for an arms race is that like I need to develop this otherwise someone else will and if you had I mean the, the alternative might be like a big brother type state where that's not good either but like I like it's a scary thing to basically be building something dangerous just because someone else might build it and then and then it doesn't work because like suddenly the things that you've built can get in the wrong hands because some bad player can like sell it on the black market and you're literally then building your own competition and so it's a great way to motivate funding your defense like contracts but um, ah, like how is it I, and the thing that I also hate the most which maybe like is something that you can't control is to what extent the people who have the power to use these tools don't understand them and so like if you, like maybe then, 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 I don't know how far you want to extend this like if you're a good chemist can you build make drugs I don't know but like to what extent like are you legislating um, or mandating someone build something and then these like politicians can decide to hand over the keys to different institutions or like other other countries that they're trying to make peace with as a gesture and it's like First of all, like you know, they couldn't have built it themselves, but these scientists could. So, to what extent would you have? Uh, why is the power in the hands of the people who fund these scientists instead of in the scientists themselves that they're really creating something clearly of value? Um, so, like my impression is that people who built these things wouldn't like probably necessarily all agree, <laughs> agree on their use of them, right? And so, it. I wish for the future that I think it won't be necessarily governments, but like companies, right? To me, it would it bothered me so much that like we have to fight for funding or beg for funding based on saying that like fundamental physics is going to come up with something that's practical at some point in the future. Like a lot of times when people pitch theoretical physics, they still point to examples of say um, like whether general relativity is helping make clocks precise enough to help with GPS or whatnot. So it's always saying that there will be some practical application, but I don't know what it is. It'll be in the future. And like, how long are they supposed to believe that? I think part of the reason why they believe that is because like we've already done good for the government of the like Manhattan Project type stuff, where suddenly okay, like you're still you're still paying these 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 little smart kids like computing things, but. I don't like when you see like private companies basically either investing, like especially when they're not even in that domain of expertise, in say quantum computing, just to show that they can put their, their foot in it. So like, to what extent when you have private companies have research arms that are not in their domain 
And they're doing it not necessarily to really be leaders in it, um, but more so to just act like they are at the cutting edge of everything in some sense, or they're, they're basically hedging whatever technology, technological development so that they have some IP in that space. And it's like, at some level, like the fact that that company is using that to bump their stock price up, they're getting some value, like money that could be funding research. And so I think it's weird, even though I mean you can't tell anybody not to do it, but I wish that there were more structures where really like the value that's in that field or that field creates can help fund that field going forward. So to what extent like things are much longer time scale than like a patent, but you know, the field that I'm in at some point develop the things that are gonna be underlying quantum computing. And if that becomes a big thing, why come the fact that we've added value there can't translate into our field having some funding for like the crazy, crazy blue sky stuff that we do our day to day. Um, and so, as much as I can complain about that, I think the practical solution is just, can we try to set up something where when, when there are these like tech people who really love physics, like and they want to donate, they're not just creating some institute that's going to compete with other institutes to hire people away or whatnot, but we can set up like maybe pools of funding that are really supporting researchers doing the same thing everywhere. So, like I think there's some infrastructure that doesn't exist just by the artifact of the university system being the precedent um, that are more possible now because everybody can work remotely. Um, that both kind of keep co some control over the funding out of the hands of like whatever the interests are of like private companies trying to gobble up IP and make it suddenly less open science. Um, and also maybe would have, at least you'd have some sort of more like power uh, to do the right thing, but maybe that's more relevant for other fields than I think my own field. Yeah. Uh, you can move for it. I have a question about like barriers of entry in theoretical physics. I, I feel like if you go through a regular undergrad and there's something like a sort of PhD, like it might be for some you know, particular problem, but if you're like relying on like an underground background, it's super, or an undergrad background, or like maybe a little bit further grad background, it seems to like stick a little bit out. Like how do you, like every, every avenue you go down in theoretical physics is so deep and complex I know. and abstract, and like it's been worked on and developed for, for so long. Like how do you, like personally, or how to generally, how do people, um, I don't know, have enough knowledge outside of this yeah. so much more, and how do they like teach like, that, out, or how do they first develop that? I know, I think that's an excellent question, and I think that the thing is that's a more pressing question than people in our field appreciate, for like for a couple of reasons. Like, the thing is, is when there's low-hanging fruit and you have smart people attacking that low-hanging fruit, it goes like really quickly, like rapid progress can happen. Um, but in our field, there often isn't low-hanging fruit, and so there's a little bit of a brain drain you could be worried about. But the problem is sometimes in our field, the senior faculty kind of think it's mostly a brain drain. It's like, oh, kids these days, you're not as you know, good in our generation or whatever. Like that. And it's like, no, like we'd have to know everything that you know and then do something that impresses you that you haven't been doing right now to seem as good to you as like you guys were to this, the people before. So you, the thing is, is that as soon as you have a knowledge candidate that's getting a certain level of depth, because research is still set up so that it's still like you know everything that you know for the thing, um, it's very hard. So the best thing is to really have a good mentor to get you to the edge of the field and to not try to know more than you need to to solve a problem. And I think that's not something that I appreciated because especially for me, I got like this overhyped thing, this person's like this Einstein, whatever, and it's like, oh shoot, I need to really know this stuff. So the, I confronted myself with basically like, let me try to learn as much as I can. I was reading a bunch of like textbooks cover to cover, probably should have just been solving more problems because I'd at least have like um, more familiarity with it. But the main thing that I learned from that was just that I could point to different like chapters of textbooks and remember where things were when I needed it. And it's like very hard to really get a bigger picture. So like I think at the practical level, what I would tell a grad student coming now is that like it's scary when like someone who can interview for like a popular science magazine somehow gets a better grasp of the big picture than you feel like you have after years of studying the thing. And it's because it's a different skill. And so you can go for like breath with very, very minimal depth. First, to just see what you like. What do you like, like talking about to your grandma? And then you find that thing and find an expert in that field to do the depth and do the depth all the way up to the cutting edge because people won't appreciate it. They won't hire you unless you're adding something new. So, but, so the, at practical level, that's the practical advice. But I think the advice I would give to the senior people in our field is like you're asking a harder problem than you realize, which is that we're, we're, by, by adding to this knowledge kind of, we're making it harder to process it. <laughs> and so like, we need to be more aware of that and then also, it's also interesting when you have like an engineering discipline, most like complex, complicated things do not only do not have like one person who knows everything about it. It's fine to be modular, but because we're building these theoretical frameworks, we're like, we can't be modular at all in some sense, or at least when we are, it's, it's seen as a full pot, it's like really weird. So we're at a stage where we're not really, um, 
as modular as we should be for like the capacity of really, like even the good researchers to be able to add something to this complicated system because it really isn't a complicated system. It's supposed to be one simplified knowledge canon. Um, but I think that this is something that we can try to, um, like even just better like kind of maps of the field, like Tuft would have a website selling you kind of guides of what books to read. Um, and then there's like lined out theoretical minimum. It's like, we should accept the fact that we do expect some sort of baseline, be more open about it, um, and try to proactively like be like kind of assessing what the research trends are when we're giving people like advice on what to go into. Because the problem is you basically fall into whatever your advisor, what they know, what problems they have. And if people like it, that's great. And if they don't, you're screwed. And it's just like, this is not your fault. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I think that, but it's neat because there's only a couple thousand people who still have that brand wrap, I think, for a little bit longer, hopefully, of like being these awesome, like, like smart, talented people. Um, and like, they're not doing things as effectively as they could. Um, because I guess maybe there's some amount of pride of just pen and paper. I know everything that I yeah that I do, but yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah. expert in this thing is more for me it's like as like the fundraising pitch type thing so I want to be clear for that I don't want to commit myself to the but at a basic level even like semantic scholar for like the Allen Institute is making better PDF readers and so to what extent just like glossary for a paper like seeing where the first time a symbol is defined in it there's a little bit of that which just like tossing it into some language model will give you like a like a like a guess of like the keywords there um, and so at the level of just a, simple, a single paper um, there's some research workflow tech that you wouldn't like you would hope that maybe like, I mean, it's really funny that there's this niche of where we have funding from grants that could pay for tools that would make our, like, like the data processing easier for us as people reading papers. Um, but unless there's a charity that's willing to do it or, like, whatnot, there's no case for it to scale. Because something very bespoke would be very helpful to, like, the high energy theorists who have very standard formats for their papers. But, for example, like, LaTeXML, like, just taking a paper to HTML will run into problem if you have, like, the wrong LaTeX packages, <laughs> right? So we're just very lucky that we all, like, copy and paste it from each other's, like, notebook, like, whatever. Um, like previous papers that were like it's relatively standardized. Um, so there's a level of the same paper which I say like glossaries for paper. And then I think that the problem that we run into, which I, I, I mean, I, I'm trying to talk to more experts um, on whether there's something there that actually would like turn around. But we are speaking different language, I would say. And it's a translation problem between, um, like, I guess to whatever extent, like, the first step I would say is like mathematical, like, reverse equation search. So just literally seeing the same symbols. In previous papers, like say, like I, I hate the fact that we get scooped sometimes by results from whatever, like 20 years ago, and that shouldn't be a problem. Like there is Google that you can do literature search, but even just like reverse equation searching for papers would have done the step that like Sasha Debayev and my advisor did, which is connecting memory effects to um, the soft theorems because it's the same equation and momentum space almost looks the same structure of the equation. Um, and so you could say that I could replace Sasha with a reverse equation search and the right like <laughs> like index of papers. So there's that. And then I think at a deeper level, it's literally the fact that it's this very bespoke translation problem and that some of us don't know how to phrase our questions in the other person's language. Um, that I think goes a little bit beyond the type of semantic search you would have uh, as like a, like a law student trying to find like um, some like prior example or like, or like you know, case law. Because there, there should be no ambiguity in the phrasing versus we have like ambiguity beyond um, like just like trying to translate between equivalent languages. So I think that there's a level of abstraction there that's different, but that's just feeling it, right? <laughs> like, but um, I would love to quantify like, that or understand a bit more, like how to speak to a machine learning person <laughs> and not sound like I'm just like, <laughs> yeah. So there's something that I think too yeah. much for uh, I think yeah. physics is becoming increasingly specialized. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And because of this, maybe, we haven't had, as like, any universal physics, yeah. any Einstein or any Landau or anything like that. Do you think that's inevitable because physics becomes so hard for me to understand and there's more part of it? Do you think that is a problem? 
I think there's a part of me that wants to think it's inevitable so that I don't feel bad that I haven't done well, right? I mean, like, there's a part of me that's like, it's impossible, it's not like, it's hard, right? I mean, the same way that when I give a public talk and I try to explain my research, like, it's been reassuring to try to think, like, okay, so what does it mean to give a good, like, public level description? So I have to use only layman English, which I probably failed just because I'm not thinking in that language. But on top of that, I have to, like, have the concepts be also the, like, the, the common concepts that you use. Um, and then if I try to say, well, I don't want to compromise accuracy, like, how long would it take me to use layman English, layman's version of that language to explain this concept, right? And that might be bad in a way that's like longer than the time I have for my talk, right? So I can say like this is an impossible task. It's too like too complicated of an idea to convey accurately. And I care about accuracy because I'm a good scientist. <laughs> and so all these people who are good at public speaking are like they're they're that's why you don't like what they're doing because it's not accurate because it can't be. Uh, um, so I like to think that there's a part of it which is that the problem is getting harder. And then the thing that reassures me is that all of the people that I admire, like they I mean like, <laughs> like only the kids these days even know Python, right? So like, there's a, like a level of um, just they wouldn't try to solve the problem uh, by asking for help from other fields. Instead, they'll get upset, leave the field, go work for Google, and that's great. But like, the thing is, is you could instead like either work for Google, get money or whatever, come back and as alumni help us actually solve these problems. So what I'm saying is, I think that there are tools from other fields that we don't import because of the, the kind of the history of the way that our research works. Um, and that I obviously like people who are like just solving PDs or like using numerical methods, there's more kind of cross um, pollination, I guess, between techniques because they need to compute these things. And for some reason, it's just mathematics for us. It, like there, it's, there's a level at which we're not solving problems in a way that would make it easier to have a larger impact. And I think it's a little bit of a sociology thing and that we can fix that. And it'd be fun because you could do it with the, as like a larger group and you'd be our generation of physicists are gonna like actually <laughs> try to like, um, to address this problem, um, so yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Just, just because you said about um, not talking to people on the discipline, how much do you talk about applied analysis? Applied. I mean, the like, definition of applied. I mean, yeah. if you're like, if it's helping you with waveforms, it's kind of applied. No, it's not really. Um, so I think that that's the downside of being in a little theoretical physics bubble. But the upside is that everybody thinks what you're doing is awesome, right? Because I mean, like, if you go to another department, they're like, "Why are you doing formal string theory? Like, you can't measure it." Right. So, so you you avoid the the negative feedback in your bubble, but you don't always talk. So I think the best thing is that, um, like, I think I would be more likely to talk to. You, uh, maybe someone in a different discipline that would be useful for like the research workflow stuff than maybe a straight up applied physicist, just in my in my experience. So um, not super often unless they have cool like conference series, for example, sometimes there's some tabletop uh, like theorists who are interested in what's like the cutting edge in tabletop uh, experiments that will bring people through and whatnot. But I, I would say that it's not even just location, like even when you're in a normal like group at a university that has those groups, you're not actually talking. Like you might run into each other, like like at a, a colloquium tea, but like, you're not having conversations where you're learning from each other. Because part of the problem is, is like you can't use each other's tools unless you understand what they're useful for. Um, and so normally you need to know a little bit of both. Um, and there isn't that. Do we have time for one more question? Anyone would like to? Um, yeah. How do you deal with failure? I mean, I think the <laughs> it's a definition of failure is like it's always you're always failing or like uh, you're still trying. Um, I think, I mean, I, get, I think the definition of failure is kind of the time scale at which you said that this thing had to be done or not, right? So I think the problem with our field is that we can also like say that there is this like infinite time scale where we're all like like contributing to it. Um, I'm lucky that I have like a faculty job, so at some level, like there's like that's a success versus a failure. Easy, easy failure is not getting a job, right? Um, and that's hard to see when you have talented people who just aren't lucky that in that job market, or there's some FOMO and one person gets all the offers. Um, but I think that, yeah, I mean, definitely, it's a weird. It's not clearly like always an obvious failure. It's more of a slow burn of like things like the, the next like aha moment not coming fast enough. Um, and that's, that takes a toll on you, but probably not one that you fully appreciate unless you like, try to be like retrospective about it. But yeah. I think I just have one more question. Yeah. It's a bit of a big question. Uh -huh. um, 
What improvements would you like to see in your field? Would yeah. that be a better gender balance or more interdisciplinary discussion? What do you see as necessary to improve your field? And where do you see the field going yeah. in the future? So I'm happy. I think like perimeter, like, like the place that I work is a good place to be trying to be a part of this because exactly it cares about theoretical physics. So if I want to care about my field, I think the first thing we got to do is realize that we are a field, we're a field of a couple thousand people. Um, we know who each other are, and sometimes you can even just go and inspire, happen, find like uh, the data people. So I think that we should basically, instead of thinking about every time there's an opportunity where somebody donated to like a research center or a new like grant schema, um, we take initiative or action on that. Like to what extent we know that if they want to fund these ideas, the, the, our employer is in some sense each other, even though it's not literally, it was coming from different things. So I think more organization in the field will help solve a, a few problems. One of them is like, whatever funding issues or distributions of resources as far as like if you like the kind of lore is that if you have an academic job you've made it even though depending on what university you're at you either can have postdocs or not you have someone who can help you write grants or not so there's some things where maybe like we can help each other there and then also once you recognize like that kind of field structure as opposed to like your academic institution uh, you can care about the pipeline entering it right and um, you can also care about like what are the things people are actually working on rather than what are you working on or like what are people working on now that I might hire. So it's, you, you care about a different set of things. And so I think just, I guess, taking ownership of the fact that we still have that valuable brand, using that to kind of create some structure. They're not, they're not trying to compete with universities, but in addition to it, that really is cross-section academia by that field. And it's supporting that can then also, I think, lead to what I think will be more not, maybe not breakthroughs per se, but increasing the odds of it. Because once you have that infrastructure, you can start to say, well, like, what would really make a research better or easier to do? Like, maybe it's like hiring some people who are machine learning experts or whatnot um, to make like, more bespoke versions of things that like industry will build. Um, and so you can ask those questions only when you have like someone who can commission that, right? So I think that that's the future is basically like recognizing that we're doing we're part of this awesome legacy valuing that even if like some of us it's like like the odds are if someone is successful that's great rather than just individually uh and then trying to support that and thinking about how do we make it easier to do what we're doing and ask for that so amazing yeah um just a quick follow-up yeah uh, on, but with regards to the agenda balance yeah um how soon do you see that improving it to a much better standard thing i mean i think i see it improving like when the conditions are improving in some sense like i mean um, it would be super cool to really be able to say, like for my personal story, to pivot like this kind of arc of like who's the next Einstein type stuff to we are as a group, and then like why like those opportunities should be something that we can take advantage of in some sense. Like uh, we're definitely not using that brand while we still have it. Um, and then I think that if there are success stories in that sense, like if we can get um, like for example, even like a two body problem with with physics. so like say you have a partner who's at a different institution, like people will literally choose worse institutions, right, to be with their partners. But if you think about it, if I was really employed by my field, perhaps there can be, like, some number of postdocs that are, like, from that field, right? So basically, if the field is hiring you, that's who you're working for. It doesn't matter where you're working. So there's certain logistical issues that I think will actually help with gender balance if you have that type of structure. But I think that the timescales for which those things change are timescales where you really have the, the data or the means to change them. And I think that, like, so I'm, I'm worried about that. I think that, that structure can be there much sooner than maybe the impact. But I think, um, you know, it, I, I do think that we can have a positive change and that the people who want to be in our field won't have the reasons to leave um, because they're important there. Like, basically, we should see physicists, and the same reason for, like, like promoting, like, uh, gender equality or whatnot, is that you have people who could be doing work for you, right? Like, you have talent. And I think we don't always view our colleagues as talent because we view them as like someone who's trying to get a job instead of us, or they might win a prize instead of us. But like if you see it like, no, this is our field, and if our field doesn't do something cool, we're going to all be screwed, as so we want to recruit talent. Um, but we don't have a mechanism to really view that as the field. And so I want to help, help people create that, um, so that then that argument becomes really important. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, can we all give stuff to screen